Welcome everyone to Decrypted Unscripted. My name is Dominique Shelton Leipzig. This is the opportunity that my partner David Bitterman and I have to really unpack what's going on in privacy and data security and data in general. We talk about privacy, data, information in general. We cover everything from national security to mom and pops getting ransomware attacks. It's just great to spend some time with Dominique talking about these issues. Data is everything. If a company is not digital and they are not using technology and data, they're really not a company in today's world. Thank you all for listening. Well, welcome everyone to Decrypted Unscripted. This is our opportunity to unpack what is going on in privacy and data security today, which is front and center. My name is Dominique Shelton Leipzig, and I do this podcast with my partner, David Bitterman. David, do you want to say hello? Hello, and Philip, thank you so much. As most of you know, Philip's the Chief Executive Officer of the Institute for Security and Technology, and we'll go through your background and what you do a little bit more, Philip, but We really thought it was very timely to bring you here to talk about issues such as ransomware, given not only the private attacks, but now that we've learned that there's been state-sponsored attacks through China. We wanted to get your perspective on all these issues. So thanks for joining us. Absolutely. My pleasure. Well, as David alluded to, you have had such an amazing career, Philip, in reading your bio and what you are doing as the CEO of the Institute for Security and Technology. You've been involved in the Obama administration, et cetera. Talk to us a little bit about your path to uh, cyber and information uh, security. First of all, thank you to to both of you for having me. It's really, it's a pleasure to, to be here and to speak with you on these issues. I think they are incredibly important for everybody out there. So, so looking forward to the conversation. Um, my background is, you know, mine was a very circuitous path to where I am today. As I like to do when I go and teach at UC Berkeley, I, I'll go through most of a lecture and then I'll stop and I'll ask the students, you know, hey, we've been talking about artificial intelligence and the potential for nuclear war and talking about cybersecurity and how to you know, build ethics into any company that you build or any systems that you are a part of. Where, what's my background? Can anybody guess what I studied when I was an undergrad? And almost never uh, can, can anyone. So I'm quite honestly, I'm someone who has had a very uh, path to this. I, I spent a number of years working at Raytheon Company in three different business units uh, where I was doing research for engineers and then was really fortunate to, to land a position working in the Pentagon where I was working primarily on regional issues, but also functional issues. So everything from keeping nuclear weapons out of the hands of terrorists to counterterrorism, counterproliferation, cybersecurity, wasn't really as much of a thing back then. It was, but not as much as it is today. I was then very fortunate to to be uh, seconded over to the White House and got to work on President Obama's National Security Council staff for, for almost four years. After which, I, I like to say I, I esque- achieved escape velocity. I got back to, to, to California. So I got out of Washington, got back to California. And since then, really honestly, have, have been earnestly building uh, the Institute for Security and Technology, which is it's a platform of venue where we try to create trusted space for technologists, right? It's for, for innovators, people who are building things, entrepreneurs to engage with national security policymakers. And we do a real variety of things. Cybersecurity is at the forefront of a lot of work we do. But, you know, ransomware was one that that we really delved into full full force at the end of the year last year and earlier this year. And it's it's definitely been at the forefront of a lot of people's thinking and look forward to, to talking through some of it with you guys here today. Well, you know, in your personal history, you forgot to tell everyone that you, you what, you, what you studied is an undergrad because it, yeah, it did lead to a different that. place. Skipped right past that part. Yeah, I did comparative religion and history. And so... And then you have a master's in international relations, I saw as well. And then went back to school many years later, yep, to do uh, to Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies to do international relations and international economics. Again, quite the departure from the undergrad uh, experience. But, you know, as the as the book Range talks about, I think having a variety of different skill sets is really what has afforded me the ability to do the things that I do. Yeah, that's a great book. That is a great book. 
was it the job at Raytheon that caused you to decide, I'm going to look into public policy, national security issues? And I was trying to figure out how to get into the fray. So, so mine was an interest in international relations, national, international security. I didn't know where to start. And I didn't know what the right jumping off point was. And I remember having conversations with mentors at the time. And they said, you need, you need to go to D.C. <laughs> Went back to get that graduate degree. And, you know, there's, there's elements of, of the federal bureaucracy that you've never heard of before. When, you know, I grew up in California, very distant from D.C., very distant from those circles, had never really spent time around folks who, who did national security stuff when I was younger. But there was this, the, the Office of the Secretary of Defense for Policy. There's a mouthful for you. Easy way to say it, OSD policy. And that was, for me, where I really wanted to be. I'd never heard of it before moving back to Washington, though. So going back to grad school, that's, I figured it out. What have you seen? I mean, this has been an enormous year for ransomware issues. And then yeah. with the president's basically declaration within the past yeah. week or so of China's involvement in some of these activities. What have we seen and, and what do you attribute the, the, the changes to? Do you attribute to the new administration or to enhanced abilities for us to make detection or uh, what do you think caused all this activity recently? It's a real multifaceted set of challenges, right? Where, you know, ransomware is not, it's not a novel thing. Ransomware has been around for years. I think what's really fundamentally changed are, are some of the elements of it that have really, and in many ways, allowed just about anybody to get into it that's really interested in trying to use it to make money, right? It's yeah, the bar for entry is incredibly low. The very powerful tools that we all look to use on a daily basis to help us store stuff on the cloud and, and use distributed computing capability to use things like cryptocurrency to to move funds around to to be able to to rely on all of those things. Criminals have also figured out how to abuse those systems, and what it's done is it really has given them immense firepower to engage in, in criminal activity like ransomware. To the other element of your question, though, in terms of that state role, there are elements of this that have really accelerated because of what we refer to as the safe haven that has afforded some of these actors. You know, the, the, the primary conversation is around Russia and, and those who may be operating from Russian geography. There's those who are in other places, though, too. I think with what we saw in the China instance recently, it's a it's a bit unclear just how directed that was, whereas it seems there are elements within um, the Chinese bureaucracy that were engaging in activities that were a bit out of the norm for for even their intelligence services, and that I think folks were a little bit surprised by. I think there's there's clear indication that they'd have direct ties to those within in the Chinese bureaucracy. Right, this points to really the the breadth of the challenge in terms of how do you get after this? How do you actually turn around and make it so that all of your clients in every different sector aren't facing this as such a critical threat to their businesses? This might be synergistic with what we were talking about, but I was reading an article in the Washington Post this morning, and I'll be sure to make sure it's in the show notes, but it was talking about sort of the exposure that you talked about our clients, but that companies in general are facing with these ransomware attacks. And it used to be that we just had to worry about, you know, David's uh, side of the world, which were consumer class action litigation for end users. But now what we're starting to see, in addition to everything else, I, I just read this article quoting one of the plaintiff's attorneys, uh, Johnny Ancutis, who's been involved in a lot of the consumer class actions, talking about this new widening, uh, sort of wide open area for business to business uh, class actions. And he is actually representing a group of businesses against uh, the Colonial Pipeline victim, really the, the ransomware victim saying, okay, here are these small gas stations that had business interruption and it is the company's fault. So it seems like the victims of these ransomware attacks are also becoming the object of additional, you know, risks because of litigation. It gets in incredibly complicated there, right? Because, you know, as as so, for so many years, the conversation has gone along the lines of here are voluntary standards up to which 
you you know can can push your organization. There's really been a, I, I would argue a disinclination to uh, proactively put serious constraints or serious regulatory uh, constraints in place in order to force companies to adhere to certain cybersecurity standards. I'm very interested in seeing how those, as you were just talking about, Dominique, I'm curious as to how those play out yeah, and whether the grounds upon which they're actually uh, bringing those claims can, can uh, be seen through. I think you see on the other side of the coin, congressional movement toward now effectively, and, and from the executive branch too, you saw it in the EO to a certain extent, right? really right, moving past that expectation that these standards will have to, with, can, should only be voluntary. And so you've got not only those class, act, class action suits that are going to be coming for potentially lax cybersecurity practices, but you also got regulatory constraints that are coming from the other end, where you know, Congress and the executive branch are really saying, you know what, enough's enough. We, we thought you would live up to these commitments and you're not doing it. I think when you look at some of, for instance, the colonial instance, these are basic things that, that a company can do. Obviously, some you know companies with older legacy systems or huge attack services, and you're trying to upgrade all of those different elements, departments, and what have you within a large corporation to, to use something like two-factor authentication, extremely time-consuming, right? somewhat expensive, but these are, these are basic, like changing your passwords or doing simple things along these lines. Those, those are standards that I think companies are really going to have to take a bit more seriously now going forward. They should have, you know, been taking them a little bit more seriously probably uh, before the ransomware uh, epidemic really started hitting everyone, but it really does bring it home. You're, you're absolutely right. We, we talked to Curtis Minder, who, you, you know, the, the negotiator, and yeah. he told us that Basically, he they've got together a list of just basically nine things that every company should be doing. It's and it's he said it's yep. very very simple. Yep. I was surprised that 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 basically the attacks were not that were not as sophisticated as one thought. A lot of them are just fishing expeditions and things such as that. Yeah, sure. Yeah, well, it, and at the core of it, I think we well we would argue so. The the process we ran was with sixty plus organizations from January through March, both public and private, trying to really represent all different sectors. And, you know, I think the assertion here is you will not solve ransomware by implementing these basic security protocols. But what you can do is you can raise the bar of entry. You can make it more costly for the criminal to try and attack you. And that makes it more difficult. It slows them down and it pushes them off to a different target. So to even do the basics, you're you're raising the level of of difficulty and in, in making it just that much harder for for them to come after you. Now, a determined adversary is going to find a way to get into your network. That is kind of just the 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 assumption that folks can be uh, keeping in mind. That being said, for the vast majority of those who are being hit right now, just these basic standards could really make a difference. And what are your thoughts about basically legislating or or an executive order or something like that that basically you know said these are the basic standards and every company needs to follow them? I think it gets really complicated in terms of what sector are we talking about, right? What role do those organizations play? If we're talking about critical infrastructure, for instance, I don't even see how it is that we're still having that conversation. If if you're talking about the energy sector, if you're talking about the electrical electricity sector, if you're talking about elements that really provide basic services to U.S. citizens, it seems to me that that's something that should have been instituted quite some time ago, just basic cybersecurity standards. It starts to get more complicated from there, though, right? That's fair. Yeah, I saw that you testified before Congress not too long ago. Was it on something such as that, where there would be the establishment of these kind of standards, either legislatively or, or otherwise? The hearing that I was a part of was last week, and this was for the, the House Energy and Commerce Committee subcommittee on oversight and investigations, and they are, you know, they're very earnestly in trying to figure out how to help. They're looking for ways that they can potentially provide uh, additional resources to to companies before and potentially after a, a ransomware attack. They're looking at a variety of different ways to to try and assist the executive branch in getting the word out or providing basic tools that can be available for free. But they are also definitely looking at that question, David, of, of what are some 
potential standards that need to be put in place that will, again, raise the bar and make it more difficult uh, for these types of attacks to be taking place. I think there's a, a variety of different committees, not not necessarily the, the House and or Energy and Commerce one that I was speaking to, but there are other committees, both the Senate and the House side, and then the executive branch is very proactively thinking about these things too. I would think even even in this day and age, we could get some bipartisan support for that, you know? I, one would hope. Pretty remarkable. Even just sitting through the, the hearing that I was part of. Yeah, that's right. It was... Um, it was n- fairly non-contentious. I think everyone uh-huh. is 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 in, you know, violent agreement that that we can do better. We have to do better, and that at the end of the day, it is it is a collective whole of government problem and whole of government approach that it really is necessary to solve it. And that's synergistic with uh, some frustration I do hear from companies on the counseling side on the cyber preparedness part, which is. We're willing to make these investments and we will do this, but is there anything more that the federal government could do in terms of putting technical shields, uh, blocking some of the malicious IP addresses so that it's not all on individual companies? And I, I was speaking to the general counsel of a very significant, large hospital system about this recently, and it was just sort of like... The question was raised, uh, I think even to Congress, about can companies get help so that it is not on all of their individual shoulders? But, you know, to your point, there are some things that probably can be handled uh, cost efficiently. But have you heard any talk about the federal government? I mean, you were inside the Obama administration and uh, speaking to Congress. Is any talk about the federal government stepping in to help prevent these attacks? One of the reasons that my institute got uh, pulled together the, the ransomware task force in January was we were watching really this this tidal wave of ransomware attacks against the healthcare sector last year. And, you know, as someone who spent a decade at the Pentagon, as someone who spent four years working at the White House, as someone who main, remains very close to, to a lot of the folks who are in the Biden administration, it was it was incredibly frustrating and still is, to to see what's happening and to not see the incredible resources that the U.S. government can bring to bear on this, we, to, to see that not happening. And that was in part why we, we pulled together the, the task force, was to try and try to do some of that homework for them, to say, if you really wanted to solve this, here's the full slate of actions you need to take right now. And that's really what we came up with. And to your question, it it involves all tools of national power. And when I say that, that means not just the regulatory stuff that we were just talking about, but diplomatic. So using the State Department's capabilities to actually engage with partners, to build coalitions, to go after those countries that may be providing these folks safe haven, but also the intelligence community, law enforcement, and potentially the military. Now, one of the incredible difficulties there is that, and and you guys know this as well as anybody, the vast majority of these systems are not owned by the U.S. government, right? We're talking 90% of this this infrastructure is private sector owned. So how do you work closely with the private sector to get after that question, Dominique? So how do you actually set up an agenda and work together with the private sector to go after malicious infrastructure? to do more about kicking bad guys out of the cryptocurrency ecosystem, to do more about everything you were just describing, um, I would argue is definitely being considered by the, the by the Biden administration. I think they, for instance, made very clear to, to Vladimir Putin, by way of example, that if he doesn't do something about what's happening from his territory, that we will have to in his stead. And that could mean a whole variety of different things from an offensive cyber perspective, from a legal perspective, from an international diplomatic perspective. That could mean more sanctions. It could mean even more onerous steps that could be taken from an economic perspective. I will say one thing, though, and this is, I think, incredibly important, that even, say, if the United States government were to, as some would like to call, to release the hounds 
and to really let loose from an offensive cyber capability perspective on some of these bad guys, it doesn't solve the problem. It, it will actually slow them down. It will fracture their ability to operate for a little while. It may really make it hard for some of them to reconstitute, but it doesn't remove all those vulnerabilities in those systems that we were just talking about, right? It doesn't take away the necessity to, to work even harder to defend our, our systems and to put things in place. So that's where the public-private collaboration needs to be happening so that po- folks have the ability to defend themselves. They take responsibility and they're accountable for their own actions, but that in conjunction with potentially offensive cyber from the U.S. government perspective, if you put those things in place at the same time, then you're starting to actually address the problem. That was the suite of recommendations that we put forward. One quick question I have is, you know, I've heard some people liken, you know, basically our cyber attack capabilities to, you know, a nuclear situation where, you know, both both we and our adversaries have these enormous cyber attack capabilities. But if if we unleash ours, they're going to unleash theirs. And there's sort of this mutual standoff right now and sort of a low level of activities tolerated. What, what do you think of that assessment, that analysis? It's a pretty complicated set of issues. I think there's there's some some nuance there that needs to be unpacked, though, right? Where when talking about potential U.S. government offensive cyber action against these ransomware criminals, that does not mean U.S. offensive cyber against, say, Russian critical infrastructure. That does not mean that the U.S. would go after, you know, the the Chinese power grid or something like this. The assertion here is that that the U.S. government can use very precise, almost surgical means for going after these very people and the tools that they take advantage of. And that, I think, I would argue, could help avoid some of that escalatory spiral that people worry about, right? So if you're not going after... Russian critical assets, you're, you're just going after the criminals and the criminals only. That is a much more defensible set of activity, right? That being said, to your point, David, it, it's on somebody else's infrastructure. This, this is happening, you know, outside of U.S. jurisdiction. So it, it definitely crosses what one could argue could be a certain threshold. And that's when you've stepped into a, a different set of authorities from the U.S. government perspective as to how they would even engage in that in that sort of activity, right? Title 10, moving towards Title 50, uh, you're, you're well past just, you know, having conversations about these things. That's, that's a different arena. Does that invite uh, proportional responses from potential adversaries in Russia and or China? Those are the trade-offs that the government has to, to think about. Those are the kinds of things that they have to take into consideration for sure. Does the United States have a, a nuclear equivalent capability in offensive cyber? I find the I find the comparisons to be a, a bit misleading. I think we've got yeah we've got incredible capabilities from a, a cyber a, an offensive cyber perspective. We can do a lot, but at at the end of the day, without again escalating unnecessarily. I don't see it through the same lens as I would that that nuclear uh, capability. The nuclear capability is a much different beast. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Yeah. Yeah, your theory is kind of, it reminds me a little bit of like a, <laughs> the broken windows theory of crime control, right? You keep start the low level stuff and you keep that, you demonstrate you're not going to tolerate that and then it, it w- filters its way up. Well, yeah, and I think part of the part of the ransomware challenge has been because these criminals really feel like they can continue to do this with impunity. You know, U.S. law enforcement can't get to them, and and the law enforcement departments and agencies where they reside aren't going to come after them. So, yeah, you got to put them on notice somehow. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, we're told as long as they don't attack anyone in in Russia, they're going to be that safe haven. That reminds me, we got to ask for your theory about what happened to our evil after that phone call that Biden placed to Putin. There's all sorts of rumor about about what actually happened to that crew. I don't think they'll be gone long. Uh, I think they will probably reconstitute under a new name. That's what they do. It's actually part and parcel of of, of the business. Is they all, all number of things could have happened, right? They very well could have just felt like they were taking a little bit too much heat 
And so they shut things down to, to come back at a later date when they didn't have so much attention on them. There may very well have been something behind the scenes that we all will never learn anything of that led them to that point. They may well have gotten a visit from some senior official from Moscow who said, you guys need to shut it down. There is no indication that I've seen so far that that would point to that. It seemed probably uh, that they just shut it down for the time being and they'll reconstitute under another name to live another day. Oh, that's too bad. I was I was sort of hoping that the, the theory that uh, Biden's call prompted Putin to give them a call was... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, you know, I think those those calls to, to Vladimir Putin have been happening for a very long time. It's one of those things I think those in the community will, that will be a, a very interesting day if and when we actually see actions like that taken by Vladimir Putin. This goes back a long ways. The people who are involved in these activities have very deep ties to the Russian security state. They're, they're very symbiotic and their they're economic relationships they serve each other's purposes quite well, and it would really be pretty shocking to to see to see Vladimir Putin take steps like that, particularly at the urging of of President Biden. I think, you know, he he has a power structure that he has to deal with as well, and so if he were to all of a sudden come home uh, or to add, you know, after a phone call to take steps like this, those that are around him would be like, "Oh, really? So you're cowed by the American president now?" Ah. Uh. Right, and so the trust factor. Yeah. Be, yeah, there's 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 machinations on the other side too, right? That's interesting. They look behind that. Well, plus, I, I guess they they contract out. Presumably, they contract out with the, uh, these private actors. Contract out with the, with the state. I assume. I don't. I, I know that's the case with China. I don't know if that's the case with Russia or not. There's actually a great report that just came out. I believe it was last week um, from a, a think tank in D.C. that talks about private military contractors in Russia. And they do all number of things. The Wagner Group kind of being the poster child for, for a lot of this, where they're engaged in instigating coups in Africa and disinformation campaigns uh, really all across Europe. There's, yeah, there's all sorts of contracted work that goes out to these private military contractors to include cyber, um, cyber criminal, criminal cyber activity. I think the, the ransomware piece is more of a it wouldn't necessarily seem that it's contracted out because the, the Russian government per se doesn't necessarily need to engage in this kind of activity. Yeah. It's a, sure, go ahead. And if you're going to do it, don't bring it here. And of course they benefit from it, you know, hurting us a little bit. It doesn't bother them the least bit that this drains billions of dollars from our economy every year. And if you think about the time, energy, and Dominique, this goes back to a question you asked of, you know, where the Biden administration is on all of this. They're putting intense man hours into this right now. There's an incredible amount of energy at the Department of Justice, Treasury, Homeland Security, the National Security Council, the intelligence community, just on ransomware. And what that means to somebody like Vladimir Putin is that that time, energy, and effort is not being spent on other things that he actually cares more about. So it's a, it's a good way to keep the USG distracted to a certain extent as well. Well, I think this is so interesting because it seems like we kind of came full circle in the conversation to your, you know, your master's in international relations and where we are with the yeah. geopolitics as far as um, cyber attacks, cyber warfare, and uh, the sort of cyber state of emergency that we're in now with these ransomware attacks filtering into critical infrastructure at an unparalleled rates, I guess. I liked what you talked about in terms of your proposal uh, that the Institute for Security and Technology has, which is a combination of the support of the, the U.S. government and individual corporate responsibility uh, for data and systems proactively. And this article that I, I threw into the chat and we'll put in as a link um, to the show notes in the Washington Post this morning talked about increasingly, and I saw it in the comments to the article as well, just increasing, I guess, impatience a little bit on behalf of the public with some of these sort of straightforward things like phishing attacks not being, you know, better under control by corporate entities. Do you see any training opportunities for C-suite and board members on the importance of this, and could that maybe filter down <laughs> to um, get the requisite resources to tackle this problem? 
through the task force process, one of the things that I would argue was one of the toughest to get our heads around and to think about clear solutions was what you were just bringing up. Because, you know, earlier I, I could have been a little bit more succinct where I think there's a lot of companies that are out there that are actually doing a pretty good job. I think there's a lot of folks that are out there in these IT departments that are actually trying earnestly to defend their companies and they're doing all they can and they're commendable, right, for what they do every day. But they're really in in large part outgunned and and overwhelmed with what's coming at them. I think there are those, however, who who know better and, and choose not to. And, you know, those those are the types of conversations we had through the task force process where how do you begin to think about it in in various lanes. So there are those who are aware of the threat and have the resources to defend themselves, but still decide not to. So what tools do you give them to make a more informed risk trade-off decision? Exactly what you're just talking about, Dominique. So if you're a CEO, a CFO, and a CISO sitting in a, in a session talking about resource allocation and dollars that need to go against these sorts of defenses, how do you convince the CEO that that's the, the route he should take or that she should take? How do you actually tilt it toward security? That is an incredibly difficult thing. So one of the things that we talked about through our process was making clear what tools are already available because we found out that it's not clear. There's a lot of companies that are out there who, even if they've heard of this, they wouldn't know where to go to get the tools they need, some of which are free right? So that expense factor that the CEO or the CFO might be worried about can be obviated. And one example I would give is since we put out the report, the Department of Homeland Security has actually set up a new website called stopransomware.gov that I'm going to guess you guys probably haven't heard of and that the vast majority of your clients haven't heard of, right? (laughs) So how do we get there's that that jump right so you've got this is a it's a central repository of tools offered by the u.s government again some of which are free to every american every company and everyone can use it it's it's widely but we got to get the word out so i think part of the report's intention here is to make clear what tools are available and then figure out how to get them to people again that's stop ransomware.gov for anybody that's listening that wants to go find it Okay, yeah. I'll put a link there. Yeah, it gets way more complicated, though, when it's, say, a, a company that, that maybe understands the threat, maybe even knows where the tools are, but they don't have the resources in order to do any of the implementation. They don't have the IT staff. They don't have the, the, the technical prowess, et cetera. How do you help them? And then there's those that don't you know anything about it, right? That mom and pop shop in middle America or anywhere in, con- in the country that is just as much at risk, right? I think there was a conversation I was having last week about a, a dentist's office that had gotten hit as part of the Kaseya attack. They were relying on somebody else to provide them that security. They don't have those capabilities. That's what they were paying for. So yeah, Dominique, to your question, I think as part of the task force, the hope is to get tools out there, make those available, get awareness campaigns in place so that you can help people understand what's, what's there, and then train people up and give them those resources, help them better understand the threat, help them better understand what they can do to defend themselves. There are awesome organizations that are out there like the um, the Global Cyber Alliance that does this and offers free toolkits and training, right? There's there's a their ability to, to, the Cyber Readiness Institute is another. These are organizations that are nonprofits that are doing everything they can to make these tools available and the, and the training too. So I would also say, you know, CISA, at, at DHS is really ramping up on this front to to make it so that, you know, working through ISACs, working through the National Governors Association, working with partners really across the country to try to ramp up access and awareness of these tools. It's 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 going to take time and it takes energy and effort, but it's there. We just got to help get the word out. Well, we certainly will use everything in this podcast to amplify those resources that you laid out. It's very helpful. Yeah, we need you to come and speak to our clients. That'd be great. That'd be great. One question, Dominique, is she was instrumental in, in helping uh, basically shape uh, the our, our privacy statute here in California, the CCPA. And, you know, obviously, you know, it's patterned after 
what we see in the EU. And it does, you know, limit set controls on what data can be collected, information provided to consumers, uh, the right to be forgotten, et cetera. But I wanted to get your sense on those statutes interplay with national security issues by perhaps limiting the amount of information that, that can be accessed, uh, uh, or if they, are they helpful at all, or do you think they're just sort of two ships passing in the night? I think they are helpful. I think, you know, on a much broader scale, when we're talking about the, the security of, an ev- of everyday citizens and thinking about informing them as to you know, what is being collected and how it's being used and how they can have much more informed choice and, and their ability to uh, make those decisions on their own. I think there's a whole discussion around the, the national security elements of that where the more information on folks that are you know, available and that's potentially vulnerable and that may be abused and used against them, those, yeah, that that is definitely something that should be factored into any discussion around, you know, data security and and, and national security. I think the the CCPA and and conversations uh, going forward for you know national level consideration are so complicated. It's definitely something that needs to be happening though as we look further out, you know, five, ten years to imagine a future where we haven't taken the right basic steps today to make sure that we're doing this right, it'll be too late. You really do have to be getting after that now. You know, to some of the conversations that I've engaged in with folks, you know, where they may assert that CCPA was, it was too much of a blunt instrument. It's too, you know, too forward leaning, too fast. We'll walk parts of it back then, right? You, you got to work through this process. You got to get something and get going. And I think honestly, pers- in my personal perspective is this, we're, we're, at, we're a bit behind the curve. We've, we've, I think, waited probably too long to get started. You know, I applaud it. There's going to be things that, that need to be fixed. But I think, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's an incredibly important thing, particularly for the United States, when we think about the civil liberties that this, this country are, is supposed to, uh, to take such great pride in and provide its citizens to, to not take this more seriously. Yeah, I think we have to. And to your point, Philip, I mean, this is coming up with Europe and uh, more on the privacy front uh, as it relates to global transfer of data and the the fact that we don't have a federal privacy law in the U.S. Um, has allowed, getting back to the geopolitics part, for um, the Europeans and, uh, you know, even Brazil, <laughs> Israel, every other India, yeah. India, et cetera, China to, to step forward in a leadership role apart from the U.S., which is really sort of uh, surprising. But, but I'm curious if you think there's any appetite to get anything done on the federal privacy law. I know c- companies like Microsoft and others have been crying out for legislation for a while. Do you yeah. think anything is likely to come up before midterms? It's been a little while since I last checked in on this. Uh, I do I do want to say, you know, the last conversation I had around it, there was a lot of energy and that there was uh, some hopefulness along those lines, you know, that it would be before midterms. But, but I think since that con- those conversations a few, maybe even a couple of months ago, so many other things have kind of, no pun intended, stepped into that breach. I think you've, you've got uh, so many other priorities that I think are, are making that difficult. That being said, you know, you really do hope that they can, you know, walk and chew gum at the same time and, and be able to work on this and push it forward, right? While working on some of the, uh, of the other problems that are there. These are the others and, and putting it into a, a national security context. Yeah, if you don't step forward and lead, others are going to pull you forward, whether, whether or not you, you know, like the, the direction it's going or not. It's one of those things where we have got to to take steps to, to get ahead of it so that we don't find ourselves in a situation where it's really that what's been done elsewhere is really detrimental to where we would prefer our companies to be able to be and put us at a disadvantage. Yeah. That's good advocacy for that federal bill, which is <laughs> yet yet to be, uh, yet yeah. to be drafted <laughs> as far as I know. Yeah. Right now, Philip, you know this as well as I do. We've got Dominique keeps track of this much better than I do, but we've got a we've got a Virginia statute, we've got a Colorado yeah. statute, we've got California. I mean, you talk about a patchwork quilt. That's what they they tell you to try to stay away from. But uh, that's that's where we're headed right now. Yeah. What's next for you? Uh, I mean, this is a big job you've taken on, and it looks like you're doing a lot of other things. What's 
What else is on your agenda? I'm really curious because this this is such a big issue, and it's become bigger in the past two months. Uh, but curious about you know where you're taking your organization and and what what's next for us. Ours is a is a pretty broad remit, and you know our, ours is an organization that's focused very uh, intentionally on emerging security threats that are driven by technology. It's intentionally broad. And, and within that, we spend, we do spend a lot of time on, on cybersecurity. We have a whole number of other initiatives, some that are focused on what I would argue is, is what we would call democratic resilience. When thinking about how do you actually shore up democratic institutions to things like disinformation, misinformation, how do you actually think about uh, even uh, further afield other issues that we continue to work on when it comes to, to the nuclear weapons set of challenges? But then on, you know, all things ransomware for, uh, for all intents and purposes, the report was not the intent. We didn't want to just write something. We wanted to put together an actionable framework that we could then help push forward. And so that's what we're going to be doing. We've got at least, I would argue at this point, you know, somewhat to the chagrin of some of my staff, we've got at least six or seven different lines of effort that have spun out of this that we're going to be really pushing our shoulder into. And, you know, parts of the report that we think we can be helpful to the overall ecosystem to help make actually happen. You know, the intent here was not just as one on the team referred to, we didn't want to create some shelfware. We actually wanted to put something together that, you know, we're, we're working very closely with folks in the USG. We're working with folks internationally, you know, other national governments, and we're working very closely with the private sector to try and and really get after this so that we can look back in a year's time and say, that wasn't just a great report. That wasn't just a great set of people talking about it. It was a great set of folks who got together and then did something about it. For any of the folks who are listening out there who want to get involved, let us know. We've got a lot of work to do, though, because at this point, the threat continues to metastasize and continues to get worse. And the way that I like to talk about it is if, if it hasn't hit you yet, it, you better be watching for it. Because it's it's just one of the, they don't care about where the vulnerability is, what kind of company it is, what kind of business you're in. They're gonna hit you if they can, and so we we've got to get after this with some speed in order to kind of again raise the bar of entry and, and make it harder for these guys to be engaged in these activities. One of our guests said, "There's tr- three truths: death, taxes, and data breaches." Yes. <laughs> That, that's, that sounds about right, unfortunately. Unfortunately. <laughs> but no, that is that is fantastic. Dominique, we've got to get the report posted, obviously. Yes. There's a link to, to the show notes. I don't think we can thank you enough for what you've done. I mean, you're a true public servant, Philip. I'm really, this kind of effort and, and you know, forming this nonprofit and, and taking this nonprofit really from the ground to where it is now yep. is an enormous accomplishment. Thank and you. I think we all are extraordinarily grateful for it. And and I, I'm confident that you're going to have make some sifts and put some dents in the in the armor here. Uh, so it's just, I, we can't thank you enough. We can't thank you enough for your time and for everything that you've done. Truly. Thank you so much, Philip. This has been amazing. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you for listening to Decrypted Unscripted, a podcast by David Bitterman and Dominique Shelton Leipzig. If you're enjoying the show, please rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. To learn about the podcast, you can also go to our website, 